Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be speaking to you today. Uh, I'd like to talk to you about the next quantum leap in artificial intelligence. So in 1946, the ENIAC was commissioned, was the world's first digital, electronic, programmable, general purpose computer. Uh, and it was used by the United States Army to simulate the universe. Now, not the entire universe, of course, a very small piece, namely the piece of a projectile flying across a battlefield, but it worked and it was effective. And in the years following, many other computers, faster, bigger, and more powerful, uh, that were inspired by the ENIAC uh, were, were built. Until uh, 1982, Richard Feynman, a quantum physicist, was trying to use his computer to simulate a piece of the universe, and he realized that his computer had a bug in it. Now, not the normal kind of bug that can be fixed with a software patch. This kind of bug was more fundamental. He realized that the bits in his computer could only be either one or zero at any given time, which may seem normal, but to a quantum physicist, that's very limiting. Because in quantum mechanics, information is much more capable. And in fact, it can have two unique principles that regular information cannot, namely superposition and entanglement. Now, superposition is the idea where things can exist in more than one place at the same time. And it's not as if you have, say, multiple copies of an object, or it's traveling back and forth between very quickly, uh, uh, or it's in one or the other you just don't know. It's, in fact, two separate, equally true realities where the object is in both places at the same time, and there's physical consequences for that. The other interesting property that information can have in quantum mechanics is the idea of entanglement. And that's the idea that information and correlations about information can exist and link things even if they're not physically connected. So imagine that I have two quantum mechanical coins and I prepare them such that they're entangled and I keep one for myself, I give one to you, and we go about our separate ways and then eventually we decide to flip our coins now, flipping a coin is a one-bit operation. Uh, you'd either get a heads or a tails, which is either a one or a zero. And since it's completely random, there's no way to predict which one it's going to be. However, if my coin and your coin are quantum mechanically entangled with each other, we will always get the same answer. If I get heads, you get heads. If I get tails, you get tails. And until one of us does it, it's impossible to predict which it will be. But these coins have uh, this relationship with each other, this correlation that extends beyond just the, the, either of the coins themselves. So if we think about this, this breaks one of our deep held beliefs about reality. This idea that if I have a physical system and I can draw a box around it uh, and nothing enters or leaves the box, then I should be able to have a complete description of everything that's happening in the box and understand its dynamics. But if entanglement is real, then that doesn't work that way. So we call this non-local. It's even if the pool balls are contained inside the table and none of the balls is leaving the table to another table, they can still have relationships with balls on other tables that, that defy our understanding. So if you try to simulate a quantum mechanical system with a regular computer, it gets very expensive very quickly. Because not only do you have to represent the state of each bit, but also the relationships and the superpositions of all of the bits to each other. Uh, the equations that describe these are very simple, but when you actually do the math on the computer, it gets very big very quick. And so what Feynman realized was that a classical computer is just not an effective means of simulating a quantum mechanical world. But if you could build a quantum computer where the bits, instead of being just one and zero, could be a superposition or could be entangled, then you could use that computer to simulate the quantum world, and you wouldn't have to keep track of all of the extra correlations because the universe would do that for you. 
So when Feynman proposed this in 1982, no one had any idea on how to actually build a quantum computer. And so everyone pretty much just ignored him and uh, kept on building regular computers because that was the easy and very profitable thing to do. So many large and sophisticated computers were built. We saw the explosion in classical computation ability through Moore's law. Uh, and they started running bigger and bigger jobs and simulating larger and more complicated pieces of, the, of our universe. Um, but mostly just the classical universe. So this is one of the largest classical simulations ever done. Uh, you may recognize this from the movie Interstellar was done by Kip Thorne, a, a physicist at Caltech, who used a supercomputer to generate what a black hole would look like and the gravitational lensing of looking at stars on the other side, on the far side of the black hole. A wonderful, wonderful simulation, but done of a classical object on a classical computer. Recently, very exciting things have been happening in artificial intelligence using classical computers. We figured out how to build algorithms that can look for high order correlations in patterns, such as on a Go table. And the DeepMind team at AlphaGo have used algorithms that exploit those correlations and figure out what is the, the best move, the most advantageous move in playing Go to defeat even the best humans. And we heard yesterday that those algorithms have been extended to even more complicated games like StarCraft. So very exciting times in artificial intelligence using classical computers in their, in their capacity to examine and isolate and exploit these high-level correlations in, uh, in, in large amounts of data. And we know that in principle, a large enough fully confect, uh, uh, connected neural net can solve any problem. But it's too cumbersome and too expensive to actually do this way in practice, so we invent tools. Uh, like MapReduce, sharding, SIMD, uh, pooling, convolutional nets, um, uh, dense matrix operations, and all of these uh, tricks that we can use on a classical computer to make more sense of these higher order correlations. And we can see that this has been extremely successful as the stock price of NVIDIA has shown uh, eight times over the last two years, because uh, they build chips that are very good at taking those kinds of algorithms and analyzing those higher order correlations. But all of these techniques, as powerful as they are, even at playing things as complicated as Go, all share the same uh, insight, which is powerful as it is, is fundamentally flawed. And that is that they take larger problems and they break them down into smaller pieces, solve each of them independently, and then try and put them back together. Which seems obvious that's the way you should do it because that process we call factorization has been the only thing that has been successful in computer science. But what it does do is it destroys high order correlations. Anytime you take a big space and you chop it up into little pieces, there are inevitably some high order correlations that you're throwing away. Some part of the large level holistic pattern you, you, you lose by looking at things little bits at a time. This is Lenet 5, it was Jan LeCun's sort of, uh, algorithm for doing handwriting image recognition. It was one of the first very successful uh, convolutional neural net applications that was able to um, detect and discriminate handwritten characters. It was uh, really great for the post office to be able to read zip codes on envelopes. Um, but at the same time, it still uses this uh, this technique of just looking at things little bits at a time. And so inevitably, some of the higher order correlations get lost in that process. Now, can quantum computers help? Uh, is there a way that we can use the power of the quantum computers to, to solve this problem or to make artificial intelligent algorithms that extend beyond what you can do with classical computers? So a naive way of doing it would be to leverage the principle of superposition. That's where things can exist in more than one place at the same time. So imagine I have a quantum computer which has quantum bits. Each of them are in a superposition. And so it's like my quantum computer can be thinking about many things at the same time. 
each of them in an independent quantum reality, looking at a different part of the problem. And this does get to a little bit of the truth where there is an inherent parallelism uh, with a quantum computer, but it's a, it's a shallow truth. Because if I were to actually approach writing a quantum algorithm this way, once each of my superposition computers had finished its job, I would have to go and check each one in order to look for the answer. And that would take longer than just running the, the, the program on a classical computer to begin with. The other thing is that it's just factoring in disguise. Even though I'm using the weirdness of quantum mechanics to do it, I'm trying to isolate the problem to one piece at a time and not exploit the inherent correlations uh, uh, that, that, my, that my problem, that I'm trying to understand. So what we want to do is build a quantum computer that uses not just the superposition, but the entanglement uh, to show that all of these quantum computer elements that are in superposition are all connected with each other. And that's the thing that makes it powerful. Uh, and this is because no bit is an island. So here's an island that's pretending to be a zero. Uh, or maybe this is a zero that's pretending to be an island. But in either case, it's just pretense. We shouldn't believe it. No bit is an island. Because of non-locality and because of entanglement, all of the bits are in connection with each other. They're all intercorrelated with each other. And that's the property of the quantum computer that we want to use to understand our, our overall system. Uh, because interpreting correlations is the essence of intelligence. So fundamentally, a neuron is also a correlation processor. Uh, it takes some input signals on its dendrites, and if they exhibit proper correlation, then it outputs a signal along the axon. Computational neural networks work on similar principles. We can think of brains as being better than silicon CMOS processors at looking at these higher order correlations. And it's good to ask the question why that is. Why are brains at this point more effective? It's not because neurons are better correlation engines than transistors are. In fact, transistors are orders of magnitude faster than neurons. The thing that brains have going for them that silicon microprocessors don't is that they're in three dimensions, whereas a microchip is only two. And having that extra dimension, the dimensionality allows for a brain to be much more deeply interconnected and exploit higher order correlations when looking at data. And that is the, the, the nature of its intelligence. So a quantum computer can extend that much, much further, where instead of looking at just a 3D brain, it can process correlations in a very large dimensional Hilbert space uh, and find correlations that we wouldn't be able to find efficiently in any other way. So we're still in very early days in, in building quantum computers. We're, we're sort of at the phase of where the ENIAC was in, in 1946. But we're able to simulate very small pieces of the universe, but now instead of just small pieces of the classical universe, small pieces of the quantum universe using our quantum computers. And they show the potential of this technique to understand how the, the patterns of our universe behave and what are the higher order correlations that we would like our artificial intelligence uh, to be able to understand. So from the ENIAC all the way to StarCraft, the, the computers that we have uh, have been used to simulate a lot of both artificial and realistic universes. Um, we don't know if our own universe is in fact just a simulation, but we do know that if it is a simulation, it must be running on a quantum computer. Furthermore, if we want our AIs to be understand our quantum universe, our AI must also be running on a quantum computer. Thank you very much.